You're listening to the Games History Book Doc Biz Microcast. I'm James Batchelor and I am joined as always by Chris Dring. Chris, how are you and have you spent the weekend playing Pal World like apparently the rest of my social media feed? No, apparently, uh, I think I'm the only one that hasn't played Power World um, this weekend. But it's, isn't it wonderful? Let's see, I mean, I know there's a bit of controversy around some of the designs. They look a bit like Pokemon. But isn't it wonderful to see um, a breakout game like this uh, uh, still happening in 2024? Uh, and I actually think in a year where we've not got... We have a lot of big games, but we don't have a lot of those sort of games that suck the oxygen out of the market. Mm. You know, there's, there's no Diablo, no Zelda, no Hogwarts. Um, it doesn't look like that anyway. Um that you know, I think we might get a few of these this year, and I'd love that. Yeah, Great. absolutely. Like you know, hats off to them for for doing so well and getting off. To, is it four million sales in three days? Four million sales. I don't know. I'm assuming that doesn't include Game Pass. It is, so you said sales, yeah. which suggests that's just sales. It doesn't include Game Pass subscribers, and they've had to get Epic on the line to try and sort out their <laughs> server issues. It's. I mean, I'm sure they've worked basically twenty yeah. the whole weekend. But it's a, but it's what a wonderful success story. Um, it's always lovely. It's, to see. it's good to see. It's good to see. I'm. I'm. Int- I still am intrigued to see if you know Nintendo and the Pokemon Company go down any kind of legal route because. There's more than a few striking similarities between some of the characters, but yeah, equally, it it doesn't help that every time I say the media refer to it as the Pokemon with guns game. That's all, and Nintendo, yeah. n- and it's a survival. It's, it's genre wise, no, it's not. It, yeah, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's uh, like the yeah. Power World devs have never said, "Hey, we're giving you Pokemon with guns." Like they've never said that, but that's just just the way it's been presented. That's the way that everyone kind of associates it. Um, now it's an interesting. I, I do. I, I, I do intend to check it out myself um, uh, via Game Pass. I uh, might install that tonight. Give it a give it a look. Um, this is the microcast. We're going to be talking about the biggest stories from the past week. Um, there is so much. We were messaging back and forth last night, in fact, Chris, about how much we've got to try and cram into this. So I'm going to do a little recap because I kind of acknowledge all the big things that happened. And even then, this isn't all of the big things that's happened. Like, obviously, layoffs continue. This is awful. But um, we had so many more layoffs. I don't think there was a single day last week where we didn't run a layoff story on GI. Um, One of the big conversations that happened last week uh, was your fault, Chris. It was the subscriptions discourse. So you did an interview with um, Philippe Tremblay, Ubisoft's director of subscriptions. Uh, He was talking about how subscriptions won't take off until... Gamers get used to the idea of not owning their games. That was the quote that got picked up by a lot of people. And there was a lot of kind of backlash. Well, there was a lot of backlash. And there was a lot of people who was like, well, we don't own our music. We don't own our videos. We don't own film. So why is this any different? Yeah. Um, the big one that uh, people were latched onto was um, Larry and CEO Sven Vicky said uh, that Baldur's Gate 3 and none of the other studios games are going to be going on subscriptions because direct from developer to players is the way. And uh, people have been hiding, holding that up as, yeah, yeah. he's right, etc. Um, UK retailer Game has confirmed it's going to be dropping its pre-owned games business and will not be accepting trade-ins after February the 16th. Um, kind of want to come back on that at some point and then the Xbox Developer Direct the showcase was shown off a a range of uh, titles including uh, new 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 unveiling was Visions of Mana Uh, we got an update on Ara History Untold this kind of civilization like strategy game we got a really good look at Obsidian's uh, first person RPG Avowed we got more info on Hellblade 2 and more of interest most of interest to me Indiana Jones and the Great Circle Maybe we'll squeeze in some uh, fanboy gushing about that a little bit later. But first, I wanted to talk about a piece that you've literally just put up on the site. I don't know, I'm looking over there. My laptop is over there, that's why. Um, Literally put up on the site just a few minutes ago um, that the industry is braced for two years of pain. Now, this is not up 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 to two two years years. of pain. Up Up to two two years years of pain. Okay, hoping for 18 months with good behaviour. Obviously, it's not a particularly long piece. I do do recommend everyone read this. Um, it's, It's... Brilliant piece, Chris. Kind of talk us through the kind of the key points from this. Well, um, so yes, so I, I spoke to a load of I, I sometimes just conversations with CEOs, head of investors. There will be some more pieces that I'm working on that will have fully. Lot, everyone's anonymous in this article, but la- there are some pieces of people who are not anonymous, and they'll be speaking later on. But it's about uh, all the layoffs and the um, the cuts that's happening, and it was basically trying to see: look, is this going to stop? When does this slow down? What's going on? And we sort of we sort of talk about why these things are happening, and we talk about um, in the piece it sort of covers 
look, inflation's high and inflation being high causes two things. It causes everyone's costs to go up. It makes profitable companies unprofitable, already unprofitable companies of which there are a lot in video games becoming even more unprofitable. And then you've got you know investors just going, should I take a gamble on a games company? Or should we just stick our money in the bank and earn 5%, mm. right? It, it, is, it creates this, um, you've got that sort of, um, uh, uh, that big macro issue. Um, there are other macro issues as well, including people spending less and that kind of thing. But then you've also, um, uh, you've also got the games industry challenge of the sheer number of games that were commissioned a couple of years ago that come into market. And uh, these pe- the people we spoke to were just saying, look, this, the release schedule is not going to calm down for a couple mm-hmm. of years. Um, this inflation is probably not going to start going down until the end of this year. Um, you know, there was a few people who think two years is quite pessimistic. Um, but there are people who think two years is probably just think two years and, you, and you'll be all right. And it's that's the um, um, that's the that's the thing that we're sort of going through as a as a as, a, um, um, as an industry. And that you know, look, the industry isn't is a good industry and it's growing and it has a lot of potential long term. Just that there's going to be a lot of short term pain. And I think the thing that's most depressing about the piece that I did was this, this they called this the year of closures. Mm. Um, you know, we didn't really have too many businesses closed last year. It was a lot of cuts. Um, but this year they, they do expect that we'll see um, quite a few more businesses simply go under simply because, you know, they're unprofitable and they can't get the investment. And that's the and that's the thing. And you're going to see my my thing, my worry is obviously when you look at it, you know, when you've got a company, when you're a company that's sort of struggling for profitability, you end up focusing on the bits that work. Right. And you end up cutting the bits that don't or sidelining the bits that don't work. And so companies will focus in on what they do. And that might involve cancelling that game or it might involve cutting that team. And that means if there are fewer games being developed, that's there's few opportunities for services companies. There's few opportunities for media. Um, there's also, um, uh, you know, the fact that the, the recruitment we used to be a talent shortage. Now there's an abundance of talent out there looking for work. And that has an impact upon the recruitment sector. So you've got all of these sort of the whole we, we know nobody's in a nice everyone's impacted by each other now and it's um you know there, there's it's, it's it's a bit tough and a few people that i spoke to and i might this will come out later i think he was talking about how they don't think certain companies um have cut deeply enough and one person said to me that um they think elon musk saw it coming and that's why he sort of butchered 70 percent of twi- uh, twitter <laughs> and um and and um and basically force everyone back in the office and says, right, no, we need to be, we need to batter down the hatches. It's going to get tough. And I think we're getting to that point now. So, yeah, it's a bit of a bleak, mm. bit bleak story, a bleak piece. But I think it's worth noting, you know, we just had Powerwall do very well. There is investment happening. We just saw um, Leslie Benzie's company just got a huge uh, jump of money as well. So people are investing. There's a new studio, I think, third age. Yes, um, Fourth uh, Star Games. Uh, they have unveiled this morning. I did an interview with them, CEO and co-founder Paul Gouge. Um, they... It's basically look, Paul and Alex Rigby are the co-founders behind Playdemic, the golf clash developer. This is their fourth studio, um, so they've they've set up and sold like three studios before this. And yeah, they 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 seem confident. Like they set up um, a new studio. It's interesting actually. Like they they were talking about um, the markets they're going to be targeting, and you know, unsurprisingly, they're going for mobile again because I believe most of their previous studios have focused primarily on mobile games. Playdemic obviously did golf clash, and that was a huge mobile hit. They're not discounting other platforms, but they're still focusing on mobile. And he was saying that um, as as challenging as as mobile has become, and you know, considering you know, Playdemic opened in two thousand ten, so just after the App Store, so they've seen all the changes to the mobile market. As challenging as mobile has become, people aren't like people are still playing games on their phone. You're not seeing a, a like a decline in engagement and stuff on their, on mobile playing. And there are still success stories happening. Like they, you know, they, it's harder to become one. It's absolutely more difficult to become one of those standout successes. But they are still happening. So yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of the top line that you want to take away. Yeah, yeah. And the bar for investment is high, but people are still mm. investing. And it's the it's it's an industry that's in good shape. You know, I say gamers. You ask gamers if they feel there's a crisis going on in video games. They're going to look at you and go, "What are you talking about? I'm playing loads mm. of great stuff all the time." Um, and I'm happy and I'm spending most of my disposable income on this thing. So it's like, let's be absolutely clear, you know, this is still a great industry. It's just that um, these negative headlines that we've been, that just seem to be getting worse and worse and worse, you know, it's not, it's not suddenly going to stop with the financial year. I think that's what I was trying to see if we might, you know, things mm. might look better in the next financial year. But by the sounds of it, 
we've got to wait for those interest rates to start dropping um, and uh, the release schedule. I don't, I'm not entirely convinced by the release ske- schedule argument. Like I, I know that there's loads more games coming to market. It's clearly a problem, but it's always been a problem in video games. So I just, I'm not entirely convinced that's the biggest issue. I think it is things like interest rates and um, overexposure and all this mm. kind of stuff. So, but, um, but yeah, still a good industry. It's a very strong industry. Um, just it might get a little depressing. Yeah. I'm kind of bracing myself for you. I, I think the the person you spoke to that said a year of closures is absolutely spot on. Like we've seen a lot of kind of trimming um, last year. I think we will see business. We've already seen a couple of smaller studios close. Um, I'm kind of bracing myself. I'm still likening it in my head to kind of that 2008, 2009 sort of time when we lost things like Midway or THQ, like that, mm. you know, that, that sort of era. It was... The industry was a little less oddly it still it doesn't seem very sustainable at the minute but i'd argue because of live service and because mm. of the fact that legacy games are selling for longer now possibly because different subject but pre-owned is not a thing anymore you know we I, you seeing a lot of companies that are profitable at their core if you've you mm. know cut away at some of the at some of the excess um uh, you get a lot more of that whereas back then you know if you're a big company and you had a two or three flops on the bounce yeah you know it it, it, it would it, or even less you know one bad flop could killer business you've let's not, let's not forget thq and you draw and for instance and, and things like that it can cause it yeah. um I, I think we're a little bit more you know game companies are a little bit less reliant on having to have a big hit every year but it's mm. obviously um it's obviously tough i want to kind of latch on to that word um unprofitable like because i i i read that you know it, it's in the feature quite a few times like you know the word unprofitable there are many unprofitable games businesses out there um i kind of there's been a lot of conversation around like you know companies prioritizing profits over people particularly around these kind of layoffs seeing seeing companies that are some companies are making good profit and then still laying people off etc but i think in this context like i think there's a very kind of um anti-capitalist uh sentiment out there that like profit profit equals bad like you know if you're making too much profit you're doing a bad thing Ultimately, like these profits are what's keeping these businesses alive, which is keeping the the employees who haven't been laid off still there. I mean, I'm obviously not making excuses for companies and so forth, but like, as awful as it is that Unity has laid off close to three thousand people since June, um, which is insane, like a ridiculous number of people. I believe they've still got like dozens, like not dozens, more like you know, like thousands more than that are still there. So the the focus yeah. on on getting games love- businesses profitable is to safeguard the jobs that have been saved, and I think those efforts are important as well. Yeah, I mean, um, I think you're right. Um, I, I mean, I'll start, you certainly could criticise Unity, <laughs> and certainly could criticise. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but but. It, it, it's you're right these companies are kind of reacting to the market they're in like a lot of people go oh they spent too much during the pandemic but the truth is a lot of companies didn't have a choice if your competitors are spending excessive amounts of money building up new teams and growing their you know if you're a, I don't know, a strategy game developer and your strategy game comp- and, uh, and somebody in another your competitor is really leveling up their strategy games you kind of have to do the same thing right and it and we know everything's in relation to each other if, if everyone's offering four day working weeks and and cutting um uh, increasing wages and increasing benefits you have to kind of cut you, know, you can be that company that's i'm not going to increase wages i'm not going to invest in my team then you're going to get left behind it's a very difficult very difficult position to do that some companies could do that and i'm sure they did but um uh they kind of had to, you had to react to what's going on in the market then. And the, and so there's, I do have an element of like, you know, the people that go, people, companies spent too much, aren't they? So they probably felt they had to, you know, Sony had to buy a load of studios because Microsoft was buying a load mm. of studios. You know, EA had to offer a ridiculous sum of money for Codemasters because Take Two were trying to buy Codemasters. We were in this hyper competitive industry. You kind of have to, um, if you want to be that a really hyper competitive company and you're, and you're going head to head with similar businesses, then you have to kind of react to what they're doing. And if they're spending lots of money, you've got to spend lots of money. And it's and it's that's what's yes, there's no doubt that's causing. Pa- I think the biggest issue is the starkness of it. Mm. Like only a couple of years ago, it just seemed like the power was with the employees and um, there was a, nobody could find enough talent. And it was like it was like so much money was invested. So many new studios were launching all the time. And then we went from that and almost overnight it's the opposite story and i think for me that's what's most like i can't I, well how has it gone from that to this so mm. quickly i think that's probably the biggest shock um the industry is going through it's gonna be a very interesting year or two years um and i uh, no doubt we'll, hopefully, hopefully year hopefully year. Um, we're going to be discussing this on quite a regular basis i suspect so um we'll kind of pause that discussion discussion there for now um want to talk about the uh 
subscriptions conversation that, that was started by our interview. <laughs> Your Twitter feed this week, I imagine, has been delightful. Um, yeah, I, I just, you know, you talk about the Larian boss, right, commenting on the story. He wasn't commenting on the story. He commented on t- IGN's tweet of a quote from the story that they wrote, which is from the rest of the feature <laughs> that we did. Like, it's and it, it's I, I'm really if you Ubisoft listening. I'm sorry, right, because I appreciate the headline may have led people into that quote. Like, t- the, my biggest frustration with it, and I, I'm frustrated by it. I dread to think what Ubisoft is. All these people that think Ubisoft was saying we want to get customers used to not owning their games. He did not say that. In fact, several times he said basically the opposite to that. He said that you know com- people come in for subscription. And then they might buy the games afterwards. The important thing is to offer both. It's what he yeah. kept saying. It's the important thing was to offer both. And um, this quote about... And it's not even a controversial quote. If subscriptions are going to grow, people have to get used to not owning their games. He clearly thinks that's going to happen because it's happened in DVD and CD uh, music. Um, but, um, uh, yeah. But Ubisoft, nobody in this... I've not met anyone in this industry, really, who's involved in the sector who genuinely thinks subscriptions can become a dominant model in video games, right? Our current community, consumer spending model is free to play. That's how we get people spending on video games on a regular basis. We don't do we do subscriptions. Subscriptions popular, but there is a ceiling on it. So I think MPD said ten percent of the mm. industry subscription. That's probably going to grow, but I don't think it's going to grow very much. And I don't think Microsoft thinks it's going to grow <laughs> much. You know, you know. And it's there's a there's um, there's a truth to it. I actually the thing for the Ubisoft interview for me, which I loved the most, was that he talked about the fact that their biggest month was October. And the reason why their biggest month was October is because Assassin's Creed Mirage came out. And I've done, is it 30 hours, Assassin's Creed Mirage or something yeah. like that? It's, sh- it's, a, it's certainly less than the it's 100 relatively short. that it takes to do Valhalla, etc. Yeah. Which meant, which meant if you were, you know, I suspect most gamers could complete that in a month. And what they saw was, you know, they see an influx of people come in, subscribe for $18 and play a game for a month and then unsubscribe. Right. And you could do the same for Prince of Persia, 25 hour, hour experience. And that's what they're promoting. And they're OK with it. And I liked that, you know, one of the things about the second hand market, which I'm sure we'll come on to, was the fact that, you know, I used to, if I used to buy a game that I wasn't too sure about, I'd play it, think it's okay, or play it and love it, but then like, yeah, I don't really want to keep it. And I could trade it in two, three weeks later against the next one. And it allowed me to, basically the tri- cost of AAA games for me was significantly less than mm. um, the actual uh, RRP as a result of that. And, um, and that's what, this, this is a way of, you know, they said one in 10 people as a result of this, who have, um, they've seen on Ubisoft Plus are new customers to Ubisoft. Now I'm assuming the numbers aren't very big really, but it's just that's that for me is a great thing. It's a great offering from Ubisoft Plus and Ubisoft just receiving a hammering for a quote that was sort of taken out of that taken out of the context of the question that was mm. asked. And I'm and I'm and I'm a little frustrated by it and I dread to think how frustrated Ubisoft is and I hope Philippe doesn't get put off doing media interviews in the future because I certainly didn't mean <laughs> to see um uh, Facebook memes of just random that quote sort of from mm. completely unrelated Simpsons posts or something like that. Oh it was, um, it was, it was a bit. It wasn't what he said, and I actually think what Ubisoft Plus is is quite cool, and I think a lot of companies should mm. look into perhaps doing something similar, a way for you to be able to access these games uh, in a more affordable way. But it does involve not owning them. But you know, for some people, that's yeah. fine. I, I I took the reaction in in two ways. On the one hand, like I. I liked seeing so many people kind of saying, well, I'm going to continue buying games. I'm going to continue owning my games. Like There are a lot of people basically defending the current model of you buy the games and you own them and subscriptions there for stuff you want to try. And, I mean, we've been saying as a team for, for a good few years, like there are concerns of if subscriptions does become gom- dominant, you go back to that kind of... Um, that age of gatekeepers, like the subscriptions, essentially, subscription services essentially become the gatekeepers. They decide what games go on, what type of games become popular, what type of games get the support. And we don't want to return to that, particularly given that we're at a stage where anyone can produce and release a game and it's got a half decent chance of success. Again, hello, Pal World. Um, so it was kind of encouraging seeing, like, right, no, as, as, as tempting as the offer of convenience and access is you know to having this library of games versus just buying them uh, buying them outright individually like it was it was encouraging to see so many people kind of like no this is the stuff we wanted to we want to keep going and that kind of encouraged me like yeah i don't think i am with you i don't think subscriptions is going to become dominant it was the overreaction of right everyone start pirating ubisoft games like that's not even vaguely a reasonable response. My favourite, and I, there, there was half a dozen of these in my feed of people going, 
um, Ubisoft must be okay with me not owning their games then. And then somebody said, I haven't bought a Ubisoft game in 10 years because they're rubbish. And I'm like, well, which, which, which one of that? <laughs> have you been not playing Ubisoft game for 10 years? Or is it that they're rubbish? Because I don't know how you'd know if they're rubbish if you're not playing them exactly, for 10 years. Exactly, yes. So, the, um, and, uh, so but, but I, for starters, I've got Prince of Persia Lost Crown. It's, great. Uh, it's not true. Um, the, um, the, um, but, um, uh, yeah, I was, it was, so the, I'm, I agree. I'm a little bit worried about subscription, um, particularly on, you know, on Xbox. So many of its users have Game mm. Pass. And I've had indie publishers say to me, you know, if you're not on Game Pass on Xbox, it's tough, yeah. right? It's difficult. And that's the situation where you end up having to try and get on Game Pass in order to have a success on Xbox. And it, that's for some games and some companies. And that's, um, you know, that's that's tough. For, but obviously Xbox is a very small corner of a much, 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 much bigger industry. And so it's um, and so as long as it doesn't become too dominant, as long as it just becomes one option to access games then it has then it's good and but as you rightly say as everyone rightly says you know um um to you know you, you could have a situation where you if you can't get onto game pass and you can't get onto psn or you can't get onto apple arcade or whatever um that that'll never happen but that, yeah. you know if, if you can't get onto some of those services um then your game's going to struggle that would be a bad future but you microsoft has said it everyone says it nobody seems to think that the subscription is gonna it's not with these get, games are not like music they're not like film they're too long people you know the value of subscription isn't quite as obvious in games as it is in the other industries you know, i watched 10 tv i watched 10 tv shows so far this year i've played one game mm. right so it's the it's the it's that and so one of those makes sense in the subservice and one of those does not yeah absolutely um Circling back to what you were saying about like you know, almost uh, subscriptions being this almost rental service and how, how pre-owned games used to enable that. And I'm, I'm now flashing back to, I used to, I think game used to have a rule of like, if you bring it back within 10 days, you get a full refund or full full trade-in or whatever it was. Um, so I would like buy something and if I didn't like it within 10 days, and I would play like, I wouldn't like complete it, but I'd play a fair amount of it. And it's like, no, that's not quite for me. I would go, in, I had this string of like trade-ins. That's obviously not going to be as much of an option now. Um, because game, as much as game doesn't, and game isn't anywhere near as dominant as it was back when I was using it like that. But game dropping pre-owned feels like a moment. Um, there are pre-owned businesses. It feels like a moment in history. Yeah. It feels like a moment in history, rather than it actually having a material impact upon the game. Yeah, today. yeah, that's um, yeah. It, it certainly. For me, it was um, they used to do this thing where you could trade in for any four games. They used to do it every now and again. It was an offer: trade in any four games and get a brand new one for ninety nine p. And I used to have all these old, like rubbish Xbox three hundred and sixty games that just ended up. I ended up I don't know, picking up from the industry or whatever, and I would just go in with four old Xbox three hundred and sixty <laughs> games and get myself a brand new one for ninety nine p. I did that loads, and it was a thing. Like that was the whole mm. thing. Games Elite reward card offer was all about. Um, uh, doing that and here's the thing it was so prolific I think pe people don't realise it's how prolific pre-owned was like the supermarkets did pre-owned yeah. right? that was everybody did pre-owned games it was like it was a normal thing and um, and, and get, publishers hated it because it meant it killed their legacy games business and um, but you know gamers liked it because it enabled them you know I think I remember towards the end of my time on MCV which was a retail and publishing publication so we talked about this a lot didn't we um, but um, um Towards my t end of my time on MCV, um, Martin Gibbs, who was the CEO of Game at the time, uh, revealed that over ninety percent of people who traded in games at Game did it against in-store credit, mm. did it for in-store credit. So it really was creating this, you know, it enabled people to buy new things. So I always thought it was a cool thing. But look, since digital, yeah. um, pre-owned people, there's fewer games being traded in. Fewer games being traded in means there's fewer pre-owned games being sold, and it just sort of died off. But it's worth noting that CEX is actually the UK's biggest chain of video game stores, and that's an entirely second yeah. hand video games outlet so and it's not it's not the end of pre yeah. but it does feel like a significant thing if you've been around the industry yeah. for 10 15 20 years yeah it, like, particularly like you know following all like you said like all the previous arguments and discussions and, and conversations we had around pre owned like you know certainly a decade or so ago I had, I had flashbacks like last week when we were talking about them um, the fact that game was dropping pre-owned i had flashbacks to do you remember ea's project ten dollar where yeah, you, you'd like buy. I think it was like Mass Effect, and there'd be a code for the DLC. Um, I know it was an, like you paid like an extra ten dollars, and you'd get a code for the DLC. And then if it traded in, you wouldn't have that code. You wouldn't be able to. That whoever bought. Yeah, there was a load. There was yeah, it didn't work. No, it didn't work. Um, but but yeah, I do remember. I and it, uh, I remember. Do you remember this? This is a very insider baseball story. So sorry, listeners. But um, uh, many many years ago, I went to an ASDA event. ASDA is a UK supermarket, and I and I spoke to who a guy who's the head of ASDA 
Entertainment, who ended up becoming head of PlayStation UK. And um, I um, spoke to him about, and he said to me, oh yeah, we're looking into going to pre-owned. So I put that on the front cover of MCV and it caused such a, as they were furious, they called me up, screamed at me down the phone. It's not true. We're only just talking speculatively. And I thought, no, you weren't, were you? And then two months later, they launched a pre-owned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it yeah. was the, but, it, but it was like, that's what it was. It was so tense that like people hated it. Some of the, some of the vocabulary used around pre-owned yeah. was fierce um it's not the case no. anymore and it's, it's surprising then like now given how fierce the the sentiment was against pre-owned that there wasn't more of a reaction or a celebration for like from the industry itself so uh, brendan explores this in this week in business he actually looks back at past attitudes towards pre-owned and what it actually means that game um as much as it's not the biggest chain it was the most prominent chain in the uk and one of the more one of the more known games specialist games retailers in the world i'd argue um mm. Like the fact that it's dropped pre-owned, like what this kind of means. So that's that's absolutely worth a read. I'm going to squeeze in one more thing because we're uh, starting to run out of micro time. Um, the Xbox Developer Direct, Chris, did you uh, did you catch all of this? I did. Uh, I think the games look great, They're really good. And that, you know, I was saying earlier at the beginning of the thing, there's a lot. Of, there's not a lot of massive games coming out this year. There's a lot of stuff that looks really mm. good. And I thought, I thought everything looked really good. Everything that Xbox showed looked really good. I re- obviously, I'm, I know what you're excited for is Indiana Jones. I love machine games, not just their Wolfenstein stuff. All the Quake levels they've done mm. as well. Like they are a great game developer. And and I, I don't know if you remember this, James. There was an Indiana Jones game on the N64 that never came out in Europe. And I was really... Remember I was, it. I, 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 really hate, I hated THQ for decades because I believed that it was their decision not to release it. Yeah, well, I mean, the N64 died a death. Well, yeah, but I, I, so I understand, but I was, but I was, I was gutted that I didn't get that. So I'm really, this will be my first Indiana Jones game. I think I'm, I'm very excited nice. um, for that one. Yeah, no, it was a really, really good lineup. I kind of need. There's a couple of trailers I need to go back and watch again, or, or kind of ones that I, I missed and I want to go and watch. Um, Ara History Untold. I kind of want to see the proper overview of that because a friend of mine got me into Civ Six last year, so I'm now. <laughs> Really quite oh. into turn-based city building. I'm rubbish at them, but I quite enjoy them. Um, Avowed looks quite interesting. I'm, I'm kind of, it's it's nice to see Obsidian thriving and actually getting to to make stuff that they want to make. Like they did really well with the Outer Wilds, which was kind of um, their Outer Wilds or Outer Worlds. I know it's Outer, Outer Worlds. Worlds. Sorry, Outer Worlds. Outer Worlds. Um, name confusion. Um, the Outer Worlds was really really kind of interesting like their take on a kind of a Fallout style RPG. I think it was really doing some interesting things. I mean, tr- yeah, the obvious connection, you know, the obvious comparison here is that like, this is essentially Obsidian's Elder Scrolls. It looks like they're doing a fair amount to kind of differentiate it from that. Like it looks, I quite enjoy a good fantasy RPG. I quite enjoy first person RPGs in particular. So this looks, looks very interesting. Like the, mm-hmm. there was a lot of focus on the combat and, um, you know, switching out different weapons, etc. But given how, janky Elder Scrolls combat is famously like I was like actually yeah that looks like it's worth a shot and uh, yeah Indiana Jones and the Great Circle I will contain myself because I need to va- remain vaguely professional on this but it yeah. looks superb absolutely spot on what yeah. I'd want from an Indiana Jones game there's nothing Starfield level I saw no. there like oh that's a big one but I saw lots of good stuff and that's sometimes all you need yeah particularly given that when they had a Starfield level title i.e. Starfield it didn't quite get received as well as they thought it was going to so I think I think this is probably better like rather than building up something as this is going to be the game that changes everything actually just here's a great selection yeah. of titles that will appeal to a range of audiences yeah, yeah. it's going to be it's going to be really interesting and maybe one of them maybe one of them will maybe one of them will do a power world and break out and I hope so maybe I hope maybe so. we hope so I'm um, going to wrap it up there because I think we've covered a lot of ground there so I don't know about you but <laughs> A little exhausted after a very intense 20 minutes. Um, we're going to be back on Monday with the next microcast. Uh, as usual, hopefully, you can see this on YouTube. So please do check out the video version. Um, if not, you can find all episodes of the microcast and the main GI podcast on the podcasting platform of your choice. And you can get more news, insight, and analysis at the world behind video games at gamesindustry.biz. 